First of all, thanks for coming. Iqlaq, thanks for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, as Iqlaq mentioned, I was a Cal student here many years ago, the best four and a half years of my life. And uh, in the past 24 years, I've been working in, uh, in uh, Silicon Valley in various startups. And for the past five years, I've been working at a venture capital fund. Uh, Onset is a uh, early stage venture fund, meaning we, we uh, fund new companies. It's about a $750 million fund, and the company's been around about 22 years. So the, um, the talk here today is completely informal, so if you have any questions, don't, don't hesitate to interrupt and ask. Um, either I'll know the answer or I'll make something up. Um, but I titled my talk, The Importance of Nothing. Uh, and the reason for that is, is that uh, if we start with actually the, the definition of the word, word nothing, which is that it's the absence of anything, right? So there's nothing there. And the reason why that's important is because if you look at uh, what people do in, in uh, entrepreneurship nowadays is that uh, they actually don't look at markets which have nothing there already. So uh, you end up targeting markets where there are already existing solutions, ex existing companies, and that's a surefire path to, to failure. So the key to success is actually finding, um, finding market areas where there's nothing there today. So this is why uh, nothing is important, uh, the importance of nothing. And uh, you can also think of it as of, uh, the process of how you, how you find white space, you know, how you find opportunities where, where uh, nothing exists today. So uh, nothing actually has a technical <laughs> definition in my mind. Um, it actually has to be in a, in, a, in a market that's big enough. So a $10 million market isn't, isn't important. A $100 million market isn't important. Generally, you need markets that are like a billion dollars or more, uh, $500 million at least. So if you want to find a substantial market, you know, make sure it's got a lot of zeros next to it, preferably a billion dollar market. Um, it also has to be a market that's, that's going to uh, materialize in the near future. No use building a company based on products that won't be in use for another you know, 10 years. You really have to find things which are, have immediate need and near-term opportunity and uh, will grow over time. So finding a market which is a billion dollars to start off with and 10 years from now is still a billion dollars is not a worthwhile market. You want to find things that are growing. Of course, there needs to be a need for new, new players there. So again, finding a market opportunity where Microsoft is already there is, is not a good idea. You want to find uh, uh, areas where there are no, no market players. Um, Finding, you know, defining a product in, in this space actually means finding something that's a real, real need. Real need is, is defined as return on investment, ROI. So if your product isn't giving someone uh, a quantifiable ROI, chances are no one's going to buy it. So um, think about you know, real, not imagined customer need. Uh, the customer group needs to be something that you can identify and, and define. So it can't just be amorphous. You have to be able to say the customers look like A, B, and C. The customers have to be accessible. It means you need to be able to sell to them somehow or some way. Uh, the technology itself needs to be proprietary. It needs to be something that no one else can do. Because if other people can do it, then there's no point in you doing it because it's very easy for someone else to, re to replicate your solution. And it needs to have a reasonable um, implementation um, uh, ramp. So if it's something which requires you know, a billion dollars of investment to build it, then it's not a good idea. It needs to be something that you can build with a fairly finite amount of cash. And in the business that I'm in, in venture capital, generally first round funding is you know, three or four million dollars. And off of that, you're expected to build something which, which is going to work and you can demonstrate successfully in the market. You'll get subsequent funding past that, but that first proof needs to come from you know, three or four million dollars worth of, of funding. And that's all the development, all the marketing, everything bundled into that figure. Um, and that's what's really meant by you know, the finding that the technology risk level is something where you can prove feasibility uh, without having to sink a whole lot of money. And the adoption curve has to be something that's reasonable as well. Um, business models are always important. Uh, we see in our business, we see a lot of companies that come to us with great technology ideas, but no way of actually figuring out how you make money. So you know, the number one thing is thinking about how do you make money? Because again, if you can't make money, you, can't, you, know, you really can't start a company. So think about how you make money, uh, what's your pricing and revenue model, you know, what's the sales cycle, how long does it take you to sell something, um, what's the distribution model, do you sell it directly, do you sell it from a website, do you sell it through partners or retail, whatever. Um, what's the cost to build it, to maintain it, and to extend your lead over time. And all of these things have to be you know, thought about beforehand. And as I alluded to before, you know, what's the unfair advantage? What is it that's going to keep someone else from saying, hey, you know, that's a pretty good idea, I should do that too. Sometimes you can do that just by having proprietary technology that no one else can replicate. Other times it might be that you can build an unfair advantage by you know, doing something significant on the business side. Maybe you can lock up the distribution channels. 
So if you get the deal with you know, IBM to, to sell this and no one else can sell it through IBM, you know, that's a good thing. So that's your unfair advantage. We always have to think about unfair advantage because once you identify a market, you know, chances are other people are going to figure out the same market and they're going to be going after it too. How do you keep them out? So um, teams uh, are also important because you know, what we fund uh, is not only the, the idea and the business, but we also fund the teams. And it's a, a, a well-worn um, uh, adage that you know, A teams can even make a, a B, B idea very successful, whereas B teams can't make A, a ideas successful. So we put a lot of uh, our attention when we're looking to fund companies on who are the people that are in the company itself. So that's um, team quality. We like to find people who are in the top one or two percent of what they do. Um, and also people have realistic expectations of what they're going to be doing within the company. So, and we actually do see this. Somebody who says, you know, my last job was I was a product manager at Microsoft and I want to be the CEO of this company. So that's not a good solution. So you know, as, as all of you enter the uh, you know, entrepreneurial world, if you get some ideas that you want to pursue, um, you should resign yourself to having a realistic role within the company. You'll still have a, a significant uh, place within the company. You'll be very successful off the stock, but chances are you're not going to be the CEO. Um, team completeness. Uh, what this means is that sometimes people come to us with great ideas and they have a full team. Sometimes they come with a, an incomplete team. Both of those are actually good solutions. If you see a company that's got a complete team, that's great. That company is ready to go right off the bat. But it's actually also not a bad thing to have an incomplete team come in because it means that you can help them find the right person. You can help them find that right VP of engineering or the right uh, VP of marketing or whatever it is. So completeness is, is actually, uh, uh, either, either solution is fine. And uh, team chemistry, that means with, among all of the people that are starting the company, also with the investors because once you've invested in the company and once you've started a startup, you're all going to be married uh, very closely. So you really have to all get along and there'll be a lot of stress that you'll have to deal with. And the only way that you get through that is by actually liking each other and getting along with each other. So um, how do you find nothing? How do you find white spaces where, where there's opportunity? Um, a lot of people actually do this. They go to fi and find Gartner Group. Gartner Group is an you know, industry market analysis company. And there are a bunch of others, Giga, Meta, et cetera. And they publish reports on a pretty regular basis on you know, the next big thing. The problem is that you know, generally if they're writing about something, you know, that thing's already happened. Because these guys aren't in the business of discovery. They're in the business of reporting the auto accident after it's already happened. So you're reading it in Gartner Group, sorry, it's too late already. Also, the problem is if you, uh, if you read it in Gartner Group, guess what, everyone else is reading the same thing. So you won't, won't have a unique idea. There's going to be 500 other people who are going to be reading the same report and having the same idea. So don't go this route. That's the wrong, wrong route. The right route is actually to, be, um, to have some inspiration yourself, to, to see an opportunity yourself. So to be kind of internally, in, uh, internally inspired but to have that idea be externally verified. So have an idea yourself and verify it with customers. That's the best approach. So you know, the top three methods of how you find, find nothing is talk directly to the customers. You know, if you're selling to steel companies, private individuals, whatever, talk to who your target customer is and find out you know, what their needs are, where, where they're lacking, what their opportunities are, what their problems are. So the top three methods, you know, number one is to talk directly to customers. Number two, coincidentally, is also to talk directly to customers. And guess what? Number three is also to talk directly to customers. So there's, there's really no getting around it. So uh, if you want to start a company, you have a good idea, the best way is to talk to the people who are going to be buying your product. Don't read it in research reports. Don't read it in magazine articles. You try and figure it out yourself because that's where innovation comes from. And of course, there is no fourth best method. You want to talk to your customers and that's it. So um, once you've actually decided which customers are your target customers, and maybe you're targeting you know, steel companies, auto companies, whatever, um, you have to find out who, you know, who, do you, who do you go talk to. So you know, there's the old adage of also, if you want to steal money, you, know, you rob banks because that's where the money is. You don't you know, knock over hot dog stands. The same applies to um, you know, finding customers. You want to find the biggest customers because they add scale to your business and they give you leverage. Um, also, when you, when you sign up big customers, that makes it really easy to sell to other customers. When I was uh, you know, at Broad Vision and Tumbleweed and we're brand new companies, the first year, the sales pitches you gave were all about your technology because that's what the customer wanted to hear, to get a validation of what it was that you'd built. So the whole presentation would be ugly about Corba latencies, this, that, and the other. And that was the first year. After the first year, we had 10, 20 customers. And after that, the entire sales pitch was to put up one slide, which was a list of our customers. And nobody cared about the technology. They'd look at the the list of customers and say, you know, those guys must know something we don't know. 
and that's what they would buy for. So it's, it's really important to, to target big customers and, uh, and, and really focus on, on, on meeting their needs. So you know, targeting large customers, there's a convenient list called the Russell 3000, which is the 3000 companies in America with a billion dollars in revenue or more. That's a great list. So if you want to find, you know, I'm going to go after auto companies, all right, who appears in the Russell 3000 list? You want to you know, target people who manufacture dishwashers or sinks or whatever it is, look at the Russell 3000 list and you'll have a nice list of, of the largest custom, uh, companies in that space. So, um, you know, I'm recommending basically the Warren Buffett approach. Warren Buffett uh, basically invests by identifying whichever industries he thinks are, uh, are meaningful and then buying stock in the largest, most significant companies in that space. So, uh, what you might do is to pick your top three markets. Uh, top one or two is also fine. Three is also good. Um, more than three is not good because that implies a lack of focus. And then um, you know, target the, the top three customers in each segment. And those are the folks you want to talk to when you're trying to, uh, to uh, identify where your markets might exist. And don't just pick the three customers who are the easiest to get into. So, you know, your Uncle Ernie happens to work at you know, General Motors. Don't do it. You know, pick the ones who actually make sense for you. Don't, don't think about the ones who are easiest to get into. Because the problem with picking easy customers is they're not really going to be able to validate what your ideas are about. So, uh, you know, once you've actually identified which companies to go after, there's the, uh, the whole issue of finding, you know, who do you talk to within that company. So, ideally you want to get to the business manager who controls the budget, not the technical manager. Because uh, corporate acquisition, uh, corporate uh, acquisition of products is driven by the business units. It's not driven by the technology units. The technology units just rubber stamp what the, what the business units have picked. The business units are the ones who get actually pushed for uh, you know, achieving cost efficiencies, making more money, et cetera. It's not the technology groups. So, find the business manager who controls the budget. Once you've done that, um, you know, how do you find the right person to talk to? Well, work your network. That's really the best way. Who do you know who knows somebody who knows somebody who works at Yahoo or works at eBay, whatever? That's really the best way to do it. Um, that you get your highest quality feedback by that means, and people are always happy to do favors for a friend of a friend or whatever. Um, you can also research the web because nowadays you can find all sorts of information. You can read company press releases and find out who gets quoted. You can read the websites and see who the offices are who might be buying your product. That's also a good way. Worst case, you can always cold call into the company receptionist and say, you know, I'm trying to find the guy who's responsible for manufacturing at Acme Industries. Call the front desk and see what you can get. Um, this is a really hard way to do it, but this is actually what you need to do. So cold calling is it's a, it's a hard part of it, but uh, the only way to actually get real uh, validation of what it is you're trying to do is by talking to the customers. The best way to do it is, is this. So don't be daunted, and you'll get a lot of slam downs on the telephone. But um, you know, you'll, if you talk, if you call up 100, you'll get 20 that'll return your calls. It'll talk to you, and from that, you'll find five people who might really be interested. So the way to do this, actually, the mechanics of how you, you, know, you know, validate your white space idea, your nothingness idea, is to write a one page. What's the value proposition of the idea that you're putting forward? So just one page. Keep it short, succinct. Email it to your subject, and once they have it. You know, call them up just to get their feedback. Um, the importance in this is actually to, to listen to what, what they have to say. What are their reactions to the one pager you sent them? Um, you shouldn't be there you know, trying to, to, to uh, dazzle them with how smart you are, what a brilliant idea you've got. What you're trying to do is you're trying to understand what their business is. You're not trying to explain to them what you do. You're trying to understand what they do. So listen. Um, you know, it's the 80-20 listen talk rule. Listen 80% of the time. Uh, talk only 20% of the time. And don't worry about impressing them. The, you know, the, the nuggets of wisdom that they have is, is what you're talking to them for. Uh, as I was mentioning, don't tell them what the product will do for them. Let them tell you. And write down what you've learned from this, this interview. And these interviews generally take you know, half an hour, 45 minutes. They're not a big, uh, big time sink for your subject. Update the, your one pager and go to step one above. Start all over again. And by doing this, you can actually refine the, the quality of your value proposition. So when we look at new deals, when we fund new deals, uh, Iklok mentioned we uh, funded uh, Michael Franklin, who's a computer science professor here. Uh, to, he started a company this summer. Uh, we worked with him for almost a year. And what did we do during that period? We did exactly this. So I was doing exactly this. You know, write up a one-page description of what it is that his, com his company does, what's interesting about that technology, what does it enable, mail it out to, to large companies that we knew, talk to people and get their feedback. So uh, this is, again, a lot of grunt work, but this is how it works. Um, you, know, there, you guys are too young to rem remember this. And it's a, a, a well-worn um, uh, adage that you know, 
A teams can even make a, a B, B idea very successful, whereas B teams can't make A, a ideas successful. So we put a lot of uh, our attention when we're looking to fund companies on who are the people that are in the company itself. So that's um, team quality. We like to find people who are in the top one or two percent of what they do. Um, and also people have realistic expectations of what they're going to be doing within the company. So, and we actually do see this. Somebody who says, you know, my last job was I was a product manager at Microsoft and I want to be the CEO of this company. So that's not a good solution. <laughs> so you know, as, as all of you enter the uh, you know, entrepreneurial world, if you get some ideas that you want to pursue, um, you should resign yourself to having a realistic role within the company. You'll still have a, a significant uh, place within the company, you'll be very successful off the stock, but chances are you're not going to be the CEO. Um, team completeness. Uh, what this means is that sometimes people come to us with great ideas and they have a full team, sometimes they come with a, an incomplete team. Both of those are actually good solutions. If you see a company that's got a complete team, that's great. That company is ready to go right off the bat. But it's actually also not a bad thing to have an incomplete team come in because it means that you can help them find the right person can help them find that right VP of engineering or the right uh, VP of marketing or whatever it is. So completeness is, is actually, uh, uh, either, either solution is fine. And uh, team chemistry, that means with, among all of the people that are starting the company, also with the investors because once you've invested in the company and once you've started a startup, you're all going to be married uh, very closely. So you really have to all get along and there'll be a lot of stress that you'll have to deal with. And the only way that you get through that is by actually liking each other and getting along with each other. So um, how do you find nothing? How do you find white spaces where, where there's opportunity? Um, a lot of people actually do this. They go to find and find Gartner Group. Gartner Group is an you know, industry market analysis company. And there are a bunch of others, Giga, Meta, et cetera. And they publish reports on a pretty regular basis on you know, the next big thing. The problem is that you know, generally if they're writing about something, you know, that thing's already happened. Because these guys aren't in the business of discovery. They're in the business of reporting the auto accident after it's already happened. So you're reading it in Gartner Group, sorry, it's too late already. Also, the problem is if you, um, if you read it in Gartner Group, guess what, everyone else is reading the same thing. So you won't, won't have a unique idea. There's going to be 500 other people who are going to be reading the same report and having the same idea. So don't go this route. That's the wrong, wrong route. The right route is actually to, be, um, to have some inspiration yourself, to, to see an opportunity yourself. So it'd be kind of internally, in, uh, internally inspired but to have that idea be externally verified. So have an idea yourself and verify it with customers. That's the best approach. So you know, the top three methods of how you find, find nothing is talk directly to the customers. You know, if you're selling to steel companies, private individuals, whatever, talk to who your target customer is and find out you know, what their needs are, where, where they're lacking, what their opportunities are, what their problems are. So the top three methods, you know, number one is to talk directly to customers. Number two, coincidentally, is also to talk directly to customers. And guess what? Number three is also to talk directly to customers. So there's, there's really no getting around it. So uh, if you want to start a company, you have a good idea, the best way is to talk to the people who are going to be buying your product. Don't read it in research reports. Don't read it in magazine articles. You know, try and figure it out yourself because that's where innovation comes from. And of course, there is no fourth best method. You want to talk to your customers and that's it. So um, once you've actually decided which customers are your target customers, and maybe you're targeting you know, steel companies, auto companies, whatever, um, you have to find out who, you know, who, do you, who do you go talk to. So you know, there's the old adage of also, if you want to steal money, you, know, you rob banks because that's where the money is. You don't you know, knock over hot dog stands. The same applies to um, you know, finding customers. You want to find the biggest customers because they add scale to your business and they give you leverage. Um, also, when you, when you sign up big customers, that makes it really easy to sell to other customers. When I was uh, you know, at Broad Vision and Tumbleweed and we're brand new companies, the first year, the sales pitches you gave were all about your technology because that's what the customer wanted to hear, to get a validation of what it was that you'd built. So the whole presentation would be ugly about Corba latencies, this, that, and the other. And that was the first year. After the first year, we had 10, 20 customers. And after that, the entire sales pitch was to put up one slide, which was a list of our customers. And nobody cared about the technology. They'd look at the the list of customers and say, you know, those guys must know something we don't know, and that's what they would buy for. So it's, it's really important to, to target big customers and, uh, and, and really focus on, on, on meeting their needs. So you know, targeting large customers, there's a convenient list called the Russell 3000, which is the 3,000 companies in America with a billion dollars in revenue or more. That's a great list. So if you want to find, you know, I'm going to go after auto companies, all right, who appears in the Russell 3000 list? You want to you know, target people who manufacture dishwashers or sinks or whatever it is, Look at the Russell 3000 list and you'll have a nice list of, of the largest uh, companies in that space. So um, 
you know, I'm recommending basically the Warren Buffett approach. Warren Buffett uh, basically invests by identifying whichever industries he thinks are, uh, are meaningful and then buying stock in the largest, most significant companies in that space. So uh, what you might do is to pick your top three markets. Uh, top one or two is also fine. Three is also good. Um, more than three is not good because that implies a lack of focus. And then um, it target the, the top three customers in each segment. And those are the folks you want to talk to when you're trying to, uh, to identify where your markets might exist. And don't just pick the three customers who are the easiest to get into. So you know, your Uncle Ernie <coughs> happens to work at you know, General Motors. Don't do it. You know, pick the ones who actually make sense for you. Don't, don't think about the ones who are easiest to get into. Because the problem with picking easy customers is they're not really going to be able to validate what your ideas are about. So uh, you know, once you've actually identified which companies to go after, there's the, uh, the whole issue of finding you know, who do you talk to within that company. So ideally, you want to get to the business manager who controls the budget, not the technical manager. Because uh, corporate, acquisition, uh, corporate uh, acquisition of products is driven by the business units. It's not driven by the technology units. The technology units just rubber stamp what the, what the business units have picked. The business units are the ones who get actually pushed for uh, you know, achieving cost efficiencies, making more money, et cetera. It's not the technology groups. So find the business manager who controls the budget. Once you've done that, um, you know, how do you find the right person to talk to? Well, work your network. That's really the best way. Who do you know who knows somebody who knows somebody? who works at Yahoo or works at eBay, whatever. That's really the best way to do it. Um, that you get your highest quality feedback by that means, and people are always happy to do favors for a friend of a friend or whatever. Um, you can also research the web, because nowadays you can find all sorts of information. You can read company press releases and find out who gets quoted. You can read the websites and see who the offices are, who might be buying your product. That's also a good way. Worst case, you can always cold call into the company receptionist and say, you know, trying to find the guy who's responsible for manufacturing at Acme Industries. Call the front desk and see what you can get. Um, this is a really hard way to do it, but this is actually what you need to do. So cold calling is it's a, it's a hard part of it, but uh, the only way to actually get real uh, validation of what it is you're trying to do is by talking to the customers. The best way to do it is, is this. So don't be daunted, and you'll get a lot of slam downs on the <coughs> telephone, but um, you know, you'll, if, you talk, if you call up 100, you'll get 20 that will return your calls, it will talk to you, and from that you'll find five people who might really be interested. So the way to do this, actually, the mechanics of how you, you, know, you know, validate your white space idea, your nothingness idea, is to write a one page, what's the value proposition of the idea that you're putting forward? So just one page, keep it short, succinct, email it to your subject. And once they have it, you know, call them up just to get their feedback. Um, the importance in this is actually to, to listen to what, what they have to say. What are their reactions to the one pager you sent them? Um, you shouldn't be there you know, trying to, to, to uh, dazzle them with how smart you are, what a brilliant idea you've got. What you're trying to do is you're trying to understand what their business is. You're not trying to explain to them what you do. You're trying to understand what they do. So listen. Um, you know, it's the 80-20 listen talk rule. Listen 80% of the time. Uh, talk only 20% of the time. And don't worry about impressing them. The, you know, the, the nuggets of wisdom that they have is, is what you're talking to them for. Uh, as I was mentioning, don't tell them what the product will do for them, let them tell you. And write down what you've learned from this, this interview, and these interviews generally take you know, half an hour, 45 minutes, they're not a big, uh, big time sink for your subject. Update the, your one pager and go to step one above, start all over again. And by doing this, you can actually refine the, the quality of your value proposition. So when we look at new deals, when we fund new deals, uh, Iklock mentioned we uh, funded uh, Michael Franklin, who's a computer science professor here. Uh, to, he started a company this summer. Uh, we worked with them for almost a year. And what did we do during that period? We did exactly this. So I was doing exactly this. You know, write up a one-page description of what it is that his, com his company does, what's interesting about that technology, what does it enable, mail it out to, to large companies that we knew, talk to people and get their feedback. So uh, this is, again, a lot of grunt work, but this is how it works. Um, you, know, there, you guys are too young to rem remember this, but about 20 years ago, there used to be a commercial on, uh, about Compaq, which showed how they got started. And, you know, it would show them sitting in a bar, and they drew a picture on the back of a napkin, and that was their business plan. It doesn't work like that. It's not that easy. You actually have to do a lot of grunt work, but there's a payoff for doing the grunt work. You actually get, get businesses started. So it's not easy, but it's worth the, worth the work. So pickup lines. When you call these folks up, what can you do? Well, you can actually, since you're all Berkeley students, you can, you can say, hey, I'm doing some research for the College of Engineering. Um, and this is a non-threatening way to get into somebody. So you know, people don't like to be sold to, and if you pitch it like this, they don't feel like they're being sold to. 
Um, you can also flatter them. This also works really well. You can call them up and say, you know, I'm developing a business plan. I want to talk to some, some real you know, industry influencers. And people think, oh, gee, well, I must be an industry influencer. So the flattery really works. And I do that all the time. But, uh, and, and there's lots of things you can pepper it with. You can tell them, hey, you know, if you get this thing going, your feedback has been so great. Could we put you on our technical advisory board you know, once we get this company going? And people really like to get ego strokes like that. So uh, use that to the hilt. Don't do that if you call me, though. Um, at this stage, people don't want to hear sales pitches, so don't give them a sales pitch. What you're doing, again, is you're collecting feedback, uh, collecting wisdom on what it is that these guys do. What is it that their jobs are about? Um, you know, what is it that their big priorities are? What's going to get them fired or promoted? That's what you're trying to understand. So um, you know, don't tell them, hey, this is the greatest whiz-bang stuff. We can do X, Y, Z in 30 nanoseconds or less. They don't want to hear that, and it's not your job to actually communicate that. Your job is to really listen and try and understand what the business dynamics are. Um, and if you build the right re relationships, if you do this well, actually these guys will become customer opportunities in the longer run. So um, again, don't try to sell them, but if you, you build up a good rapport with this individual and you can call them back later to get more feedback, you might actually uh, turn out cultivating them into a customer. So the result of all of this exercise, um, first of all, is don't think that the customer will create your product idea for you. You really need to have this inspiration yourself so as I mentioned at the outset, you need to be internally inspired, and all of this is the process of externally verifying it. So uh, the customer is not going to give you the, the idea or the inspiration. You need to have that going in. You're talking to the customer to really verify what you're thinking. Um, don't became, become a slave to one customer, and this happens all the time, and there are actually lots of failure cases in, in the world of venture capital where you fund a company, and they go off and they do a project for General Motors or UPS or FedEx or some large supplier. And basically, they do a you know, one-of-a-kind you know, custom implementation, which no one else in their right minds would ever buy. So if you become a slave to one customer, basically, they're using you as, as grunt resources to do an implementation for them. So you always have to keep that in mind and always be sure to actually factor whatever it is you're, you're talking to them about, factor that to think about how can I ma make this general purpose enough to apply to other companies. And um, don't chase your own tail. So just because you have a good idea doesn't mean it's a good idea. You, know, you have to always remember external verification. If you're not getting external verification, <coughs> not a good idea. So what this ends up looking like is actually um, the best, actually the best business plans we see are not you know, 95 pages of text. Uh, there are maybe you know, 10 slides, and five of those slides are just PowerPoint pictures of what the customer before and after looks like. So you know, here's what loan processing looks like before. Here's what loan processing looks like after. This is how much money our customers save as a consequence. You know, that's the kind of thing you want to get to. So if you want to build a business plan, start with actually writing down the case studies, the case studies that show that how your customers make money or save money. So um, you know, identify and solve a core business problem. And think about the must-haves, because you'll only be able to build the must-haves. You won't be able to build the nice-to-haves. So keep a list and make sure you know what's a must-have and what's, what's, uh, what's only a nice-to-have. And nice-to-haves go out the window. Um, you know, in this case study, explain the customer's business process before and after. Explain who it is that buys this and why they want to buy it. You know, why is this really critical to their job and their success? And I think very importantly, articulate the ROI. If you guys remember the, the dot-com boom of five, five years ago, the reason why the, the boom went bust is because no one paid attention to return on investment. They just thought, hey, great new product. It does X, Y, and Z. Who knows if anybody makes money off it, but we're going to sell it. And the people that bought it actually, of course, ended up losing their shirts as well. So you have to be able to articulate the ROI. And you know, if there's one thing you can do, that's the one thing to focus on. And as you notice, what we've been talking about thus far, it's all business processes, not about the technology. So that's the other thing to bear in mind, is you know, it's the business process that, uh, that drives purchases and drives sales. What we're allowed to interrupt you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Neighbors. Right. It's, I think that's also, you know, it's a lot of uh, interesting uh, consumer products, of course. Yeah, OK. So uh, Iclock is, was wondering, how would this process perhaps differ if you're talking about a uh, consumer-focused product? So uh, consumer-focused product, um, you actually have to have an understanding of consumer behavior. If you have that, that's great. How do you validate that? Well, you can validate that by people that you know, you know user groups, things like that. It's uh, solving consumer pro products product problems is a little bit more difficult because 
But a lot of large players who are already in that space were innovating like mad. So it's a lot tougher to go in and compete against a Sony and Nintendo, uh, folks like that, than it is to come in with the next you know, kind of enterprise product. Um, but certainly there are opportunities out there. It requires that you have a good understanding of what consumer dynamics are and that you can verify it some way. Yeah. No, because the dynamics are completely different. Oh, yeah. So the question was, if you had a product which is applicable both to a consumer market and to a corporate market, should you go after both? Yeah. I, the answer is no. It may be that it's blindingly obvious that it fits better into one or the other. If it's not blindingly obvious, go after the corporate market because it's a it's a much more deterministic uh, selling process. It's really hard to predict what consumers may or may not buy, and generally requires a lot of money to be able to prove that. So how do we how do we you know, pick consumer products? We pick it based on advertising, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of advertising. Whereas if you want to sell something to General Motors or IBM, you know, it will cost you $1,000 to go there and make a sales call. So it's much more deterministic. So investors will actually, if you have two equal markets, they'd rather see you go after the corporate market because they can prove viability much more quickly. Excuse me? Yeah, yeah, actually I have uh, my concluding slides uh, is about that. But yeah, there are markets which I think have evolved away from, from being interesting and, and I'll address that at the end and I have some speculations as to what might be interesting and if it gives you guys some food for thought and come up with some better ideas. Um, so the other question is, is how many barbers are there in Chicago? Does anybody know? No? So the reason for actually putting this question up here is that um, when you're dealing with a nascent market, something that's brand new, as we talked about at the outset, there's, there's no industry research that's published on you know, the market for, for widgets is $7.8 billion this year. It's a completely new market. No one knows how big the market is. So how do you actually size the market so that you can then convincingly tell your investors, you know, this is a multi-billion dollar market? Well, the approach you take is the barbers in Chicago uh, model. So um, I don't know how many barbers there are in Chicago, but if you ask me that question, I'd say, well, okay, there are 10 million people in Chicago, you know, 5 million are male, Take some half an hour to get a haircut, you know, an eight-hour working day. You work out that math and you'll come out with a number. Whatever that number is, you know, it's probably something like 80,000. The important thing is not that, well, was it 80,000 or was it 87,000? The important thing is that you know that it's 80,000 roughly, not 8,000 or 8 million. So when you're looking at a new market, again, there are no existing market studies on how big that market is. Do a Barbers in Chicago analysis. Think about, okay, how many people are there out there like this who might be buying this? How much money would they spend for this, et cetera? So, and that'll help you actually build a model which is defensible because your investors will say, well, why is it that you think it's a $2 billion market? And you can say, well, here on my spreadsheet, this is how I figured it out. Why, although this is a brand new market, we reasonably think it's a $2 billion market. So remember the barbers in Chicago when you're looking at brand new markets. So, um, you know, nothing markets today, and this gets back to the question I was being asked a little bit earlier. You know, where are there opportunities today? Uh, some markets, um, I think, are, are completely dead. Actually, we'll, we'll jump ahead. So if you look at um, you know, what's happened to, to software and hardware, it's been completely commoditized. So you know, when I came out of Berkeley, all the value lay in hardware. You know, people paid lots of money for hardware, and that's what was valuable. Um, you know, Fifteen years later, hardware is a giveaway. It's for free. Value was all in the software. Uh, so all the big successful companies, like some of the ones I worked at, like uh, you know, Broadvision and Tumbleweed, you know, all the value is in the software, and that's what people paid for. Well, guess what's happened in the past five years? Software value has gone to zero also. So because people are offering either open source or software as a service solutions, there's no value in actually building an enterprise software company. So if you have an idea for a great enterprise software application, shelve it. It's not going to fly. Uh, where value does lie today it lies in data, and it lies in kind of you know, where, the, where computing is going, which is going towards the edge. So if you think about why I say value lies in data, if you look at companies like Google or eBay, what's their value? The value isn't in the technology. Their value lies in the fact that they have all this data. They have the data about the products being sold and the people who are buying and selling that. That's where the value lies. Same is true for Google. So um, value lies in data. So if value lies in data, how can you actually harness that? Well, that's the question. How do you harness that? Assuming that you know, hardware and software have a value of zero. So you know, there are value applications that you can build in data, kind of like Google has done. Um, you can also build you know, technologies to harness that data even more effectively. There's a lot of research being done here about that. Um, and there's also this whole trend towards you know, pushing computing further towards the edge. So if you look at this diagram, 
basically commoditization is spreading outward from that central core. Um, but today, you know, we have mobile computing with cell phones, we have gaming, we have wireless sensor networks, and the center of wireless sensor networking research is Berkeley, so it's all being done right across the street. Um, ad hoc networks as well, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, well, you can, there's, uh, you can actually, you know, there's, you can do a lot with data because what data allows you to do is to actually draw conclusions about either macro trends or micro trends. So, you know, there's a whole category of software nowadays called business intelligence. And what that's based on is looking at a mass of data and figuring out, you know, what's going on. Um, there's a lot of work getting done uh, here at Berkeley and Stanford on uh, an area called statistical learning theory, SLT, which some of you might be familiar with. But it's by looking at a mass of data and trying to figure out, well, what is, you know, what's the intelligence I can draw out of this? Um, actually, the, if, you, if you use Hotmail, Hotmail nowadays has really great anti-spam uh, an, uh, protection. And I've been a Hotmail user for a long time, and it used to be awful. I'd get literally 200 spam messages a day. And by now, I get maybe zero on any given day. And the reason for that is that Microsoft has, has uh, applied a very simple technology, which is, okay, if something shows up, if you tag it as being spam, and you know, 100 other people mark it as spam, guess what, it's spam. So they're not you know, running any sophisticated heuristics and algorithms against that piece of mail. They're basically taking your feedback, aggregating it, and, and, and making decisions off that. So actually the most effective use of data for Microsoft and Hotmail is doing just that. And it's because they're making, uh, you know, they're leveraging the kind of the power of large numbers. If you have enough information, you can draw a lot of interesting conclusions off that. So, you know, data is actually, we're getting into uh, an area of data overload. There's more and more data out there today. That data is only going to increase. Well, how do you actually make sense of it all? So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot you can do with that. You know, there's the whole area of location-based services as well. So, you know, that's what's ICLOC's pre preferences for coffee shops and where is he now? You know, so those kinds of things. So the extended internet, as I was mentioning before, is uh, you know, all of the mobile applications that are going to be driven by the, de the device formerly known as a cell phone. Um, you know, gaming is, is big. We don't do gaming, so we don't know much about it because it's, uh, it's a consumer behavior. But gaming is big. Uh, wireless sensor networks uh, is also big. This is um, computing going more and more towards the edge. You know, we used to have mainframes, and we had mini computers, and we had laptops and workstations. The next thing that's happening is wireless sensor networks. So it's computing in a very small element in a very distributed fashion. Yes? Sure. Yeah, so actually, we can go back to this earlier slide. So um, it, if you look at the, 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 what the fourth bullet here, which is the business model transformation. So you know, what's been successful recently is people who are actually offering up software as a service. So um, you know, um, Salesforce.com, wild success. And uh, what are they doing? They're offering a very basic functionality for customer relationship management. Uh, on a software as a service basis. And it's you know, very low cost and very low overhead. It maybe only does 70% of what Siebel Systems does, but it's literally one one thousandth of the cost. So that's a very easy, uh, easy uh, uh, trans um, excuse me, very easy transaction for me to make as a customer. So um, you, know, you can think about service models that transform the uh, current business models. How can you obsolete players today based on things like software as a service? Um, consumer products and markets uh, here at the beginning, there's actually a lot of demand there, gaming, et cetera. Uh, I'm not an expert in that, so I won't say much. Um, there's actually also a lot of um, uh, momentum in taking the same business, the same models, and applying it in new geographies. So you know, things that have been proven out here, selling it in, in new emerging economies, China, India, et cetera. So investing in either foreign companies that are doing that or in U.S. companies that are targeting foreign markets. I talked to another venture capitalist yesterday who's raised his entire fund, $150 million venture fund, based on taking U.S. technologies and selling them in Korea. And that's his whole value proposition. Um, technology transformations, um, as we talked about, you know, business model transformations. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on with software as a service, open source, et cetera, and this is actually throwing the traditional world of computing into an upheaval as creating opportunity. And there's also uh, this whole area of, of kind of green applications. How do you do more with less? And I think the IUR department here at Berkeley does quite a bit of work on this. So. You know, optimizing industrial processes, things like that, because the world that we're entering is, is resource constrained, uh, power, uh, resources, everything. Um, so how can you actually take that resource constrained future and uh, you know, map that uh, with uh, you know, better, better technologies? 
Yeah. Talk about health Um, uh, so the question was how, uh, how young college age students can build an unfair advantage. Um, it can be done. I think some of the, the, uh, uh, the you know, big successes, Dell and Microsoft, were actually young college age students who built an unfair advantage. But um, you can build an unfair advantage by having you know, an inspiration of what's going to be different about the thing that you're doing. It doesn't mean that you have to build that entire thing yourself. If you've got a good idea, you can build a team around you that will execute on that idea. Yeah. Um, not really. I think that's uh, you know, the question was: Are patents good? And uh, patents are actually. Let me turn my phone off here before it starts ringing. Um, patents are nice, but the problem with patents is, is that you can't really sue anybody uh, if you're a startup once once you have a patent. It's prohibitively expensive to sue somebody. So certainly you should apply for every patent that moves. You should do that, but not so that you can keep people out of your market. Probably. Probably so that if somebody accuses you of patent infringement in the future, you can trade something with them. So patents are a good thing to get, but they're not critical to success. And again, if you look at companies like, you know, what are the biggest successes today? Yahoo, Google, eBay. What do they have that's of any interest technically? They have nothing. You know, we could build eBay and Google technology here today, more or less. So the technology is out there. So um, patents, again, it's, it's a nice thing, but it's not required. I think if you can. Do some innovation on the business model, which no one else can replicate for whatever reason. Do some innovation on the business model. That's a good thing. If you get your patents, use them only as a defensive mechanism. Um, when I was at Tumbleweed, we actually had a case of patent infringement. There was a company up in the city, Critical Path, that uh, we litigated against and won in a case of patent infringement. And here, as a little startup, we were spending $400,000 uh, every three months to prosecute the case. So, and the case dragged on for years. So in the end, we probably spent $4 million, and at the end of that, Critical Paths you know, settled it by saying, okay, we'll license your technology. So what did we get out of it? You know, we, got, we got a lot of legal bills, but not much more. So, uh, and I've actually counseled companies. We had another company a few years ago in our portfolio that was, uh, um, had a patent infringement case, and we told them, don't do it, because it's not worth the expense. You end up spending too much money. So I'll wrap up here, because I think we're running out of time. But, uh, you know, my, my last slide is, uh, if you see a good idea out there that you want to go do it, go do it. Because you know, there's a lot of innovation here at Berkeley. There's a lot of smart people here who are working on stuff. Um, and uh, you know, I think just having the aggressiveness to go off and, and chase something has, has a lot of merit. So you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And uh, questions? Yeah, no, so you don't have to collect um, data illegally. You might be able to collect data completely legally as part of your business or part of someone else's business. So a simple example would be, uh, and this is, there's some work that's getting done here at Berkeley, but uh, doing statistical learning theory of predicting when a computer system is going to crash. So for example, you could say, okay, um, you know, we set up a service where if you're running you know, your computing applications at Corporation XYZ, on a regular basis, you're reporting your call stacks back to the service. And based on you know, call tree patterns, you can actually predictably see, well, the last time this thing happened, it crashed. So guess what? This thing's going to crash going forward. So the data that you're using is not necessarily private. The data that you're using, uh, even if it is private, your customers might be giving up to you freely or, or paying you to process. So you know, generally, any data you're in possession of, hopefully you're in possession of, of, of it for the right reasons and not the wrong reasons. So um, I think open source, as I mentioned earlier, I think that you know, enterprise software is dead. I think today if you want to build a software company, you either do it as open source, either as uh, software as a service, or you stick it in an appliance. Those are the only three ways you can sell software today. So open source is a good thing, but if you look at Sugar CRM, I think their innovation isn't so much in their software technology, it's, it's in their business model. And that's the important thing. And so if you can innovate in the business model and utilize open source technology, great. But innovation in the business model is actually more important and, and you know, pays bigger dividends in innovating on the technology. How do you create entry barriers for Web 2.0? Right, so for a lot of the startups, they're 
yeah. Right. Yeah, this, this goes back to what I mentioned earlier about why you know, consumer markets are tough because you know, who knows why, why MySpace was successful and you know, someone else wasn't, you know, classmates.com. Um, so it's difficult actually. So generally, if you're gonna be successful in a consumer-oriented market, you actually have to spend a lot of money. Uh, and you're not gonna be able to get a lot of money unless you're some name brand uh, professional. So if you look at salesforce.com, they're a huge success, but they spent $60 million in marketing to establish themselves. So you know, who among us could raise $60 million just to do uh, the marketing of our ideas? Wouldn't happen. So, um, so I, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of non-determinism as a consequence in, in consumer markets like that, and you have to be very careful or very wily in how you, how you build your business plan. Other questions? Yeah. So um, generally, um, investors look for liquidity events in companies in five to seven years. So if you start a company today, then you know, in 2000, starting in 2011 and running to 2013, that company should be getting public or getting acquired at, at a nice valuation from a public company. So that's at the outset. So that means that if you work backward from that, you need to be actually hitting your milestones on getting a product built, getting the first customers won, you know, getting that first revenue stream probably within 18 months. So you know, if you started a company today, your investors would want to see that you're gonna have a product built and a pilot installed with some you know, name brand type of customer within about 18 months. <coughs> and then over the succeeding you know, two, three, four years, they'd want to see a steadily increasing revenue. When companies get in trouble is when they you know, sign up that first customer and get that first revenue stream, but revenues don't go up or they, they plateau very quickly. And that's when you have a troubled company that you either have to shut down or sell off. So anyway, if, think five years and work backward from that. If you can't, can't make something you know, insanely profitable within five years, then you're gonna have trouble getting funding. Um, it, the, the question was, um, you know, if, if open source or, and software as a service are, are the only routes for, there's another one, which is to take your software and put it on an appliance. So you sell it as basically a small device versus selling it as an enterprise application. Um, it's tough to sell in the enterprise software market today. So if you look at you know, companies like Siebel, who are high flyers, you know, their revenues really tanked off, even Broadvision. Uh, Broadvision at one point had a $25 billion market cap. Uh, it's, it's probably in, in the tens of millions today, 40 or 50 million today. Um, enterprise software is hard to sell b precisely because people have figured out that you can get that software basically for free or for very low cost as software as a service. So um, I highly recommend against enterprise software. So if you want to build a software product, again, think about how you do it based on open source, how you do it based on um, software as a service or you put it into an appliance. There's uh, one company I work with who's been very successful. Uh, they're profitable. We've got $6 million in revenue. And they're an open source company. And what that means is they give their technology away for free. It's all based on uh, standard open source software. They give all of their uh, application software away for free. But for you to actually do anything with it, you actually have to call them up because it's sufficiently you know, difficult enough to use in a production environment that the only way you'll get, to get any uh, leverage out of it is to call these guys up and have them build it for you. And from that, they built a profitable $6 million a year company. So, and they're using that open source basically as a Trojan horse to get into the paying customer engagements. Yeah, so actually the, the example I was mentioning is probably not a good example because the problem with building a service where oh, so the question was uh, if you build an open source company uh, where you try and make your money on service, isn't it easy for someone else to replicate it? And the answer is yeah, absolutely yes. <coughs> Uh, this particular company is in a, in a particular segment of the market where not enough people know about it, um, that even the big players haven't gotten into it. But yeah, I don't think that that's a, a long-term path to their success. So, um, and as well, service, a service-based business model is very low margin. Um, and you know, investors don't like service-based business models, so you shouldn't, shouldn't build a business based on that. So question in the back somewhere?
Is there, oh, there are a lot of things. Um, so I think what people look for, the question was uh, when you're looking at a new investment, what, what is it that might cause you to run away? Um, there are a lot of things that make us run away. I think the number one thing we look for actually is the existence of a market because pretty much every other problem that a company might have, you can solve by throwing money at it. So if the technology doesn't work, throw money at it, that problem goes away. If they don't have the right employees, throw money at it, the problem goes away. But the market either exists or it doesn't. And throwing money at it doesn't create the market. So that's the number one thing, is being able to do some barbers in Chicago analysis that proves that you have a, a large addressable market. After that, I think what people look for is just kind of realistic expectations. And so that gets back to what I alluded to earlier, that people have realistic ro uh, expectations as to what the roles are gonna be within the company that people have realistic expectations on the deliverables they're being going to be held to, uh, the valuation, that, you know, how much their company is going to be valued at, how much money they'll get, all those things. So again, you might have a great idea, you might be a great guy, but you might say, you know, my company is worth $20 million. And actually it's not. You know, brand new companies are generally worth single digit millions. So you know, $3 million, $2 million, $4 million, that's how much brand new companies are worth. So, um, you know, having realistic expectations. And we actually see companies that come in who obviously don't have realistic expectations. If you don't have realistic expectations before they're even funded, it's gonna be a nightmare working with them once they get funded. So those kinds of folks we walk away from. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, um, uh, how you feel about uh, large customers uh, from the government side, government and education, things like that. Um, it's actually a pretty lucrative market, but uh, it's a tough market to address. And generally, early stage investors don't want to see companies that are, uh, that are uh, targeting the government market. The reason being is that the distribution um, channels into the government is pretty much controlled by some large government SIs. As well, government has very long uh, purchase cycle, and they also don't care about ROIs. So, um, you know, the dynamics that the government applies are very different from corporate customers. And principally, you can't really predict when the government's going to buy or not buy just because it's the government. If they're losing money, you know, as we are now, you know, if you're in a deficit, who cares? Whereas, you know, if you're losing money and you're the chairman of IBM, you're going to get fired. So, you're much better off selling to uh, corporate customers and not, not government customers. What about non-U.S. government? Um, yeah, that, I think the same is true there. It's, I think government market's really tough tough to address. Um, we have uh, one of our portfolio companies that sells pretty heavily into the, into the um, intelligence space because they have technology that allows you to intercept communications, whether it's telephone, email, whatever. And so a lot of foreign intelligence agencies buy that. Uh, a lot of U.S. telephone companies buy it because they're required to provide that capability by the government. And those guys are doing really well, but, there's, but it, it's a consequence of the fact that we're living in this you know, really funny geopolitical environment nowadays when there's a lot of threats out there. But if that weren't the case, would they be selling you know, like that? Probably not. Anything else? Um, the question was, if you're looking at multiple business options, uh, business model options, should you focus on multiple or should you focus on just one? The answer is you want to just focus on one because um, you know, focus is very important to being successful. Um, and you know, all of your, your peripheral activities that are connected to your business model are going to be, need to be driven by that single business model, not multiple ones. And investors uh, basically won't touch you if you don't have a clear idea of what your business model is. They might tell you to change it, and in that case, you might consider changing it, but you shouldn't go and say, hey, there's these five ways we could do it because they'll see that as a lack of mental discipline on your part. Uh, if, you're, if you're interested in opening a uh, VC fund in Taiwan, are investors more interested in someone who's friendly, who's with a track record of having fun with the business or the innovative technology, or someone who's more experienced with technology but has that kind of interest in the business? Okay, so the, the question I think would relate to, to starting a fund. Uh, the question was, if you start a fund, is it more, more important to have a business background or a technology background, is that correct? Yeah, the, yeah. the answer is actually both. So if you look at uh, the successful venture capitalists, they all have actually uh, engineering and technology backgrounds and they've worked in the business world. So they can actually understand what business needs are and they can help guide and drive businesses, but they understand what kind of technologies can actually serve those business needs. 
So like within our practice, I think every one of the, the partners at Onset has an undergraduate and in many cases graduate degree in, uh, in some engineering discipline. Yeah, so uh, was this specific with regard to a, uh, an investing fund or? Well, I'm just, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm just wondering which, if, there, if, there's a, if there's generally a, a primary focus on the investing fund, which one is more important? Yeah, th I think there's a dual focus, and it's really focused on both the business aspects and the technology aspects. And technology nowadays, it's, it's getting to be so arcane that, that you can't be a dilettante in it. So um, it requires having a strong understanding and being able to uh, you know, winnow out what makes sense and doesn't.